William Kolbrenner is a professor of English literature at Bar-Ilan University. He is the author of numerous books and articles on John Milton, Mary Estelle, and Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, as well as on other interesting issues. He has written an introduction to a recent Hebrew translation of John Milton's book called Areopagitica by Shalem Press. Professor William Kolbrenner is with us today to explain who John Milton was and to open for us a window into Milton's political thought. Bill, welcome to this podcast. Thanks so much. Let's begin with John Milton's historical context. Can you tell us who he was and what was the time and place of his birth? In what kind of family did he grow up in terms of socioeconomic status and religious orientations? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer in relationship to Milton, because in order to really understand Milton's work, one has to invoke many different kinds of contexts, meaning mm. it's not only the immediate context of where he was born or even his religion, but just the way he was enmeshed in certain kinds of cultural forces. Mm. And really the most important thing for understanding Milton and really the whole period is that Milton is simultaneously the end of the Renaissance and also the beginning of the English Reformation. Meaning Milton is affiliated to two traditions which really don't necessarily belong to one another. Think about it this way. The Renaissance is a period which emphasizes the human. Everything mm. centers around man. Right. And everything centers around ma- the making of images. Mm. And Milton is part of a Protestant tradition, um, a Puritan tradition, which is very much iconoclastic, meaning not mm. the making of images, but the breaking of images. Oh. And Milton somehow is able to bring those things together in his poetic works. That's really Milton the poet, who cannot be um, really distinguished from Milton the political thinker. Mm. And of course, theology and politics are related in very, very clear kinds of ways. Right. So Milton, just to do the basics, um, was the son of a composer, His father had converted from Catholicism to Protestantism. Mm. So, I mean, that's obviously a very live issue, the 16th century in England. Right. Probably all of us remember from high school, 1517, Martin Luther, the 10, or the 97 Theses that he puts on the church in Wittenberg. So Milton's father converts, and it's a radical move at that period, to mm-hmm. Protestantism. By the time that Elizabeth had consolidated her power, we're talking about Queen Elizabeth I, Protestantism right. was then the official religion. Uh, Milton's Puritanism, however, was much more radical than the Protestantism that Elizabeth I established. She reigned, mm-hmm. of course, between 1558 and 1603. Um, As things developed in the 17th century, a little bit closer to Milton's own political context, we see, first of all, the king impinging upon the rights of the people, the rights mm. of parliament, but also simultaneously, and perhaps even more importantly, is this emphasis on a new kind of uh, Protestantism or Puritanism, which is kind of militant in a certain way and a very, very extreme in its perspectives, mm. meaning a great way of thinking about this is going to a medieval cathedral in, in, let's say, a Catholic country and imagining if it had been in a Protestant country where all of the beautiful wall paintings would have been completely whitewashed. Yes. It's fascinating just to see that in the 16th century in England and then to see new Northern European churches which are completely without images. Mm. So Milton is very much coming from that perspective. Mm. So, I mean, it's almost an obvious question when you're standing in front of undergraduates is how does Milton accommodate these two perspectives? On the one hand, he's the great poet. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, he's the great Puritan iconoclast. Mm. So, w- why they are not going together? Well, you the, uh, and... because you have the image maker, right? right. That's the poet, mm. and the image breaker. Right. Meaning Protestants are skeptical about all forms of knowledge that are attached to images. Yes. Because it, if for them it amounts to a kind of, maybe we would think in Freudian terms, of a fetishism of an idea. Yes. About yes. It's really a kind of idolatry. Right. But why poetry is connected to making? But poets use it, make, make images, right? That's what they do. The poets are creating images, but only as an idea, right? Okay, but there still might be that suspicion that a reader will... The, the suspicion for Protestants always is in any context that you're going to put too much emphasis on the material and not enough on the spiritual. Right. You can see for many reasons, poetry I mean, poetry is always under attack. It's under attack by Protestants not only because of its materiality, but because that materiality is thought to lead to sin. If I focus too much on the outside or the external, I forget the higher goal and I get immersed right. in the physical. Right. Good, but we didn't really get to Milton's politics. That's really what you, is that really what you want to... Uh... I mean, first, I want the listeners to get a sense of what the world in which 
John Minton grows up. Mm -hmm. I, they did not have um, indoor plumbing, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really think of Milton so much in intellectual historical terms. That is Milton in relationship to his predecessors mm. and his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. um, meaning for Milton, growing up means going to Cambridge. Right. Um, it means engaging with every theological work that's written so in any tradition. It's an elitist uh, oh, for education sure. background. Well, sure. I mean, we're, we're, all, we're talking about a kind of a literacy in the 17th century by itself as a form of, of elitism. But Milton was well-educated. Yeah, he went to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And he stayed on. And um, afterwards, he felt that he hadn't done enough reading, which is hard to imagine. And then he <laughs> goes on and, and, and goes back to his father's house and spends a couple of years reading the theological mm -hmm. and political works and all the literary works that, mm -hmm. that preceded him. Went, and, later in his life, yeah. he went blind. This is already in the last part of his I, life. So. I, I'm just I'm just saying that people thought that he went blind from reading too much. Oh right. right. <laughs> But that, that's okay. I mean, his political foes said he went blind because he he read too much. No, because he defied God because he was wow. on the wrong side of history. Okay. So if we look later in his life, yeah. what can we count as his main successes, uh, professional successes, the mm -hmm. highest points, achievements in his life? So if this is Milton's job interview, what would be the highlights? <laughs> well, he would first say, I guess number one would be Paradise Lost. Number two would be um, uh, Defense of the English People, which mm -hmm. is another prose track that he wrote. And maybe number three, or maybe even number one, would be killing the king, mm. meaning that was probably on the top of his list. Mm. And then on the bottom of well, it, he's rolling his uh, so in that's this a, scene. So, so that's a very good question. So Milton really tried to prolong his education through the 1630s. Um, he actually went to Italy and met Galileo and other Catholics, which was a very strange thing for the great Protestant to do. Mm. Um, when he heard about the civil wars that were beginning to brew in in London, he was called back. In 1638, he went. He was already then identified clearly as being part of this well, debate? Well, he, he was very clearly a Protestant thinker. And in the late 1630s, mm. he was writing about really um, issues that are very much alive today, the way in which church and state were intermingled. Mm. And Milton was, of course, one of the first people to argue vigorously against that idea. Okay. So already in the late 1630s, he's doing that. We'll come back to Areopagitica in 1644, in which the king has already been exiled. Mm -hmm. um, he will eventually be executed by the people of England, which is a little bit of a misnomer because it really wasn't the people. It was mm -hmm. a purged parliament that did so. Um, he was killed by the people of England. And Milton in 1649 um, was asked by Cromwell to serve as a kind of foreign minister. Mm. I mean, Cromwell comes to power in 1651. What I wanted to mention was in 1649, Milton is asked to kind of be the point man against royalist rhetoric. Mm. So what do I mean by that? Charles dies in 1649, January 31st. It's really looked at as not only a political event, but a cosmic metaphysical event, mm. right? The world has now changed. Mm. The king has been killed. And what gets published almost immediately after his death is a text called Icon Basilica, which is a Greek title, and its meaning is the image of the king. Mm. Now, Icon Basilica was a collection of a kind of like Tehillim-like confessions and autobiographical excursions, a, a generically complicated text beautiful frontispiece, a picture, you can Google it online. It was a thing that was made actually to be disseminated, and it mm. had a very particular kind of purpose, and that was to forward the royalist ideal. Mm. Um, it was a very powerful text. It sounds even as I describe it, I know as a kind of trivial text, aside from the Bible in England in the 17th and 18th century, it was the most published text. Wow. So you get a sense of that nostalgia for kingship, mm. right? So you need somebody to argue against this. Right. So who do you call in? John Milton. So Milton writes iconoclasties, mm -hmm. which means breaking the breaking of the image. Right. Um, Charles was of a Catholic sensibility, or leaning Catholic, and that's what he was called by Milton, was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. But Charles had a sensibility which could deal with images. I mentioned before that the way it's published is a beautiful picture of Charles. He looks Christ-like. Milton, if, if Charles was of the image, Milton was very much of the word. Um, and images always work better. <laughs> so Milton wrote this very, very long tract, which scholars love, but nobody really, really understands. Somebody asked me recently, uh, talking about the Areopagitica volume, like to talk about the arguments of the tract. And mm. Milton, although Areopagitica is structured like a rhetorical speech, and we can talk more about that in a bit, um, it's very hard to locate a single argument. 
it's really like all over the place. You kind of right. just feel Milton's energy bursting out, usually in particular images or particular contexts, mm. through which he makes very strong arguments, and then he kind of pulls back a little bit. So it's a it's a weird text, right? Um, so that would be his main achievement, I think, Killing of the King, um, and he was thought of by his political enemies. And after Charles II came back from France as a regicide. Mm. Okay, so as you mentioned, the book that we are yeah. gathered here to talk about is called The Reopagitica, a speech of Mr. John Milton for the liberty of unlicensed printing right, right. to the Parliament of England. Could you clarify for us the title of the book and why is this book so important for the defense of freedom of speech and freedom of press? Well, the first thing is Areopagitica is situating Milton in relationship to a classical past. The Areopagus is this giant rock in Athens, and the poet Aeschylus imagines that justice is the seat of justice in Athens. Mm. So Milton is associating himself with that classical tradition. Um, there are other ways that he associates with the classical tradition. He quotes um, Euripides on the frontispiece, praising in one of his plays, liberty and freedom. Mm. So Milton is basically asserting a continuity between what he's doing and what was happening in the Greek the ancient, world. Yes. I mean, of course, for Milton, though, he is, his primary sets of references are always Christian. So he's writing about what he understands as a Christian commonwealth, mm. which has all of the benefits of the Greek commonwealth, And, right. all the, and the benefits of Christian commonwealth, and even more, suddenly now with his generation, the printing press. Mm. So the printing press also changes everything. Meaning now, not only do you have a commonwealth of people coming together in the agora, in the marketplace, you have a commonwealth of people who can communicate through a technology. Right. And that really does change everything, especially during this period. And our pagetica is very much a function of that. Mm -hmm. That is creating community through, liter through texts. Mm. And we know that besides this political text, there are yeah. also other political texts sure. by John Milton. Can you just mention a few? Um, you know, there, Milton wrote at different periods for different reasons. I mentioned right. the defense of the English people. That was functioning yes. very much in his... Iconoclasts. It, well, uh, so Milton defends the English people. Why does he need to? Because they're failing him. Because the revolution, as much as in his own mind, is so vibrant. And in 1644, we have the capturing of that moment of that idealism. Mm -hmm. By the 1650s, it's already over. Right. And he needs to defend the English people because they really are failing him. I kind of class these functions, as I said before, in that kind of rhetorical war yes. in, or in, for the, 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 um, the commonwealth to fight off the always present royalists, mm -hmm. who again come back in 1660. Charles II shows up. And he says, listen, after a civil war, what do you do? You can't kill off the entire country, right? Okay. So you make an example of a bunch of people. There were as a list of 20 people to be hung. Milton was among them, just even idea of his role. And he had friends in high places, Andrew Marvell and John Dryden, also poets, who intervened to make sure that Milton was not, in fact, mm. executed. So he, so he was very much associated with all of those efforts. And I was going to mention that when you don't kill all, you chose these 20 people, but they also who, sense... Who chose them? The king. The king. The royal proclamation. The royal proclamation also said, get all of your copies of Iconoclastes and the defense of the English people, mm. bring them to the local sheriff, and we're going to burn them. Wow. Okay, so it's like Milton is, we know him as this poet of Paradise Lost, but he's in the mix. So Milton continued to live and even to be active against monarchy. Well, no, by 1660, he had kept it very low profile. He goes blind. He's taken mm. care of by his daughters. Right. Um, he's lucky, actually, to be left alone. Right. But he does manage to write Paradise Lost he, during he that period. Right. Which is also uh, anti-kingship? Well, isn't God king? I mean, you know, you, I mean, it's a, the answer is yes, of course, it's anti-kingship, but it's a very, very complicated text, which is, we were talking before, before our, our formal interview about the way in which literature and philosophy and theology all mix up together. Yes. To call Paradise Lost a, it's a theological poem, it's a political poem, it's not even, that's just, the nature of it is that it's a work about the fall of man, the Garden of Eden. Yes. It is also a work about the failed revolution. Hmm. And it's also a gorgeous, incredible poem. Yeah. If we look into this uh, book's Areopagitica, what are the main arguments that we can find for free speech and free printing? Well, really, the major controversy of the 1640s that Milton was relating to was, what does one do in our contemporary terms with difference? Mm -hmm. And what are the limits of difference? 
That is, how do we deal with citizens who are other? Or better yet, I mean, that's a little bit too modern. How do we deal with, what is the limiting point of otherness? Meaning, what kind of difference can we actually include? And what kind of difference must we exclude? Mm -hmm. So Milton had contemporaries. Um, I just mentioned that this question is actually fundamental and present in all, I'm aware of all societies I'm, today. I'm aware of it, yeah. <laughs> Which makes uh, it so relevant. Right. No, so that I'm, that, as I'm describing it in this way intentionally. Right, right. Um, but I'm not and by, and by any means re- misrepresenting it in order to do that. Yeah. Um, Milton had contemporaries. They were just for the name Presbyterians, and they believed, even though they believed in freedom of religion, they nonetheless, and they believed in the, the um, a certain kind of commonwealth rule, they believed there should nonetheless be a single hierarchical church, and there should be limitations upon what things can be acceptable. Mm-hmm. I said before they believed in freedom of religion, but really they made, they made very clear distinctions. There was a famous contemporary of Milton who wrote a book called Gangrena, Gangrene being the disease, right? Mm. I don't know what it is in Hebrew. And when one has gangrene, you cut off the limb. And that book is a collection of heresies, things that must be excluded. So Milton's idea... Like a disease. Exactly, right. Right. So that's the metaphor, right? So Milton writes during that period, and for him, instead of um, cutting off sex and schisms, he celebrates them. That is, he celebrates difference as the kind of engine of commonwealth. Mm. And in this sense, is I'm sure, looked at as very dangerous for society well, order. Well, for sure. I mean, by 1644, the English Revolution really started in 1642. So he's already writing from the position of being not only in an imagined commonwealth, but in a real commonwealth. The rhetorical aim of Areopagitica is actually not against the king. It's against the parliament who are instituting their own edicts right. of censorship. And then he shows that it's incoherent for the parliament exactly. who is based on the idea of freedom to act as right. against freedom, against freedom of speech. Right. It's almost like some populists today who act, limit off difference in the name of a kind of freedom that is exclusive to their perspective. Mm. But yes, Milton is precisely doing that, saying we went all this way with the revolution, we got rid of the king, we have freedom of religion, why do this now? Why create a kind of commonwealth version of, of the king's star chamber? Mm-hmm. He also mentions a story that, he tells a story that mm-hmm. he meets Galileo in Italian prison. Okay. What do we know? Do we I know anything know. about it? I, he writes about Galileo all the time in Paradise Lost. Mm. And he's interested in Galileo there because Galileo is always accompanied by his telescope. Mm. So Milton will put Galileo in different places with his telescope. And in that way, Milton is really talking about ways of knowing, ways of seeing, mm. ways of perceiving. It's very interesting to think of these two God giants together, meeting, right? Yeah. Right, and, and of course, one's a Protestant and one's a Catholic. Um, but they're both radicals. There's also another anecdote that struck me as very interesting. That when he speaks about Moses, mm. and he says, Joshua came to Moses and right. said, there are these two people who are communicating with God or something. Right. And what can you do with this? And Moses say. I would love all the people to be... Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and then he says Moses is against censorship. Right. Well, I think, I don't know if it's a pasuk from uh, the Torah or not, but yeah, yeah, uh, 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 Yeshua is young in goodness, right? I think, and that Milton repeats that, I think, that um, Yeshua is innocent and he should really understand that if there's going to be a true commonwealth, Everybody has to prophesize. Right. I mean, Milton is not a, he's not a crazy messianic figure. Right. He really isn't. He yes. resists that. But he likes the metaphor of people prophesizing. That is, and what he means by that, I think, for this context especially, is that everybody has to take control of their political destiny. Mm. And the biggest kind of idolatry, we're talking about fetishism over idolatry or before, is the fetishism of the king. And that idolatry of the king takes away political agency. And true commonwealth can only be based upon everybody having their political agency. Yeah. Now I want to ask you yeah. some fundamental question about John Milton, because mm-hmm. as you write in the introduction to Areopagitica, yeah. he was a revolutionary, right? He supported the murder of the King Charles I in mid-17th century. He would say execution, but okay. Execution, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was also revolutionary in that uh, he wanted to legalize divorce in England, and mm-hmm. even... I was going to say weed or something. <laughs> To legalize whatever, I'm sorry. Okay, to, le- to legalize divorce <laughs> right. in English. And, right. and also 
Interestingly, he used for this purpose Jewish law against Christian tradition. Right. So he he's really in, he writes four divorce tracts. He does divorce a couple of wives, right. so he's got an interest in it. He married three, I think. But his interest is in divorce is really very much based upon his own conceptions of, of individualism. Mm. For Catholics, divorce is some marriage is sanctified. You can't break, and it's sanctified by God. For Milton, in order for a relationship to be sanctified, it has to be sanctified by the people inside of it. Right. If they cease to be Um, in tune with one another, right. it's no longer sanctified. Of course, it's gendered, and for Milton, it's the man who makes the divorce. Mm. But still, you see implicit in that in the divorce tracts the idea of individuality. And as you mentioned, right. since he can't find anything in the New Testament, or it doesn't seem like he can find anything in the New Testament, he goes back to Chazal. To the rabbis. Right. It's fascinating, right? So despite all, yeah. the, all this revolutionary zeal, yeah. it seems like you're saying in the introduction that conservatives have also have something to learn from John Milton. So what are these oh, what, things that conservatives what, what did I can see? take from well, John well, Milton? Well, I, th I think Milton is, Milton can be, and I've probably done this myself, misread as a liberal. He is not a liberal. John Locke is a liberal. Milton is not. So can you explain the difference between So them? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we had, you had asked me why Milton says, Milton is writing this tract in favor of freedom of the press, against right. censorship, personal expression, freedom. And then at the end he says, I mean not tolerated Catholics. I mean not tolerated popery. I mean, he goes through this whole thing where he says that he's going to be inclusive. And right. then at the end of the tract, he sneaks in. Of course, I don't mean Catholics. And you also mentioned that Jews and Muslims uh, are even yeah, not... Heino, Heino, right? We don't even have to, you know, you don't right. even have to say that, right? Yeah. And it's obvious that they are not all right. right. So Milton has principles of exclusion. And those principles of exclusion are that you have to be part of this Protestant search for truth. Now, since Catholics are so stuck with the image, with the fetish of the king, the pope, or the pope primarily, and also all of Catholic liturgy, they, of course, can't be tolerated because they're not part of the search for truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jews as well. Locke also, and this has just come up recently in some context, Locke did not want to tolerate Catholics. Right. But that was a political argument, because Locke believed that Catholics actually wanted to overturn the state. Right. They're not obeying the law of the exactly. state when it's in contrast with the Pope. Exactly, uh, exactly. So that just explains Locke. It's not a theological argument, it's a political argument. Right. For Milton, it's a theological argument. That is, you need to be part of this stream of flowing Protestant iconoclasm. Once you're solid or settled down in one place, it's a problem. Milton says in Pagitica, he who thinks we are to pitch our tent here, it's like a metaphor for going camping, he who thinks we are to pitch our tent here, that man shows himself to be very far from the truth. If you think you have the truth, you don't have the truth. So that excludes Catholics. But is it like saying that doubt is essential to... I would say not doubt, I would say skepticism. skepticism. Because Mil it's a very complicated argument because Milton is a faithful person. Mm. But there's skepticism built into his faith. I mean, I think if anybody can learn anything from him, that's probably the most important thing. That his, he's a faithful person, but there is deep, deep skepticism as part of that faith. Now, it also involved a certain kind of exclusion, which is to say, and I think this is how it has to be translated in order to be interesting for us. To what extent do we make exclusions in our political culture? Milton is making these, on the one hand, he's celebrating difference, which he really is. On the other hand, he puts an end to it. Right. So the question is like, so, you know, you can look at it and say, well, you know, Milton was a failed liberal. He wasn't a failed liberal, right? That's the argument. He didn't want to be a liberal. He didn't know what being a liberal was, right? I mean, the, the people will say, you know, still a lot of political thinkers will say versions of, you know, Milton was a poor version of Locke, Locke was a poor version of Mill, and Mill is a poor version of me, right? right? <laughs> Who is the true yes. perfection of things. Now, Milton, that, those were not the languages he was speaking. He was speaking Republican languages politically, and a certain kind of Christian. By Republican, you mean anti-monarchy? I, I mean like Italian Republican, anti-monarchist Republican, Greek okay. Republicanism, right? right? Which is also like a democratic idea. Well, sure, but if one looks at Milton through that liberal lens, he will always be the failed Democrat. And he is a failed Democrat because he does require these exclusions. But the question really is then, if we're constructing an ideal multicultural society, what are the limits of that society? And is that version of the Republican ideal, meaning I think terms that would be more familiar to, or I'm sure are familiar to your listeners, is there a role for positive liberty in Isaiah Berlin's sense right. in the contemporary world? Meaning we, I think, have backed into the bidiavad, in my view, but only option of negative liberty. 
Right. Because positive liberty, as Berlin himself points out, <laughs> is dangerous. Is dangerous. Because- right. Right. And we see among popularisms today in America, both on the left and the right, and in this sense, especially on the left, that love becomes a form of coercion. Hmm. Meaning, my, my love for my ideals, which should really include you. I mean, as soon as I say I love you, I'm making a claim on you. Hmm. That's why it's not. That's why love should not be part of a political discourse, right? Wow. So, if we look at Milton's politics, is just to rephrase my, I guess my question here yeah. is, he has some ambiguity for us in the 21st century because right. on one hand, Milton is on the side of freedom for Parliament right. against the king and against republican censorship. On the other hand, he is right. not a modern liberal. He's his republic is Protestant, as you say, and he is not willing to tolerate Catholics. Right. Uh, or Muslims or Jews. So what should we do with this puzzle? When you, we come today and look right. and read uh, John Milton, how can we uh, situate him, locate right. him in the public discourse? Okay, so two questions. I mean, the first one, which I think is implicit, is, you know, where is Milton on the political continuum of, of, of you know, what modern Western liberalism? And in a way, he's not. And he, it's good things that Ari Pajitica gets republished because it is a kind of Republican hiccup or the Republican beginning of a liberal tradition. Mm. You can certainly find the spirit of liberalism in Milton. It's a very weak and kind of lazy argument to say there's a spirit of liberals. Because really, because as you pointed out, there are real limits to his conceptions of inclusion. Right. So I, I think... But, but do you think that these yeah. limits are something that we should also consider today? Because you cannot have a state without having limits. Well, that's what I was just suggesting to you, that, that Milton brings to the fore that issue of, I guess, positive liberty as a defining way of talking about a commonwealth or culture. In what way positive liberty helps us here? Well, so let's talk about Israel, right? To what extent are you making Israel's public sphere Jewish, mm-hmm. right? What are the extents to which we do that? Right. That already in Milton, you know, that's, that's our own sense of we are shaping the, the, sh- the, the public sphere in a certain kind of image. Right. Um, and that has costs, you know, and I, yes. I teach, I teach our epigetica to a classroom of Christians, Arabs, and Jews. And it's easy for us to talk about it and think ideally about, well, you know, the costs are really worth it. But when you're sitting with Israeli Arabs from, from, from the Galil, it right. changes the way you look at things. Right. Because it's, it, it changes, and I think that's the challenge that Israel faces today, is we have to give a meaningful idea of citizenship, citizenship to non-Jews. Right. And that idea and in this respect, yes. John Milton has nothing to tell us. No, I'm telling you exactly that he does have something to tell us because he's defining, he's defining what the Christian commonwealth is. Right, but he doesn't seem to care so much about those who are not feeling uh, part of the, uh, of the we. Right, he's, well, right. Of the we, the people. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about a, a, a very, he, they're already a, a very small group of othered people, meaning during this period, right. I mean, you know, Catholics and Protestants are not exactly getting along well. Yeah. You don't see them at the Macaulay <laughs> buying yes. Cheerios, right? They're not, you know, right? So it's, those exclusions, they're not surprising. Yeah. What's more surprising about our epigetica are the inclusions, mm. right? People who are really who are embracing theological ideas which have political consequences look, that look like they might be dangerous, mm-hmm. right? Meaning, and you see it later on in the century, or even at the same time, that Milton is surrounded by um, diggers, levelers, people who really, really are proto-democrats, mm-hmm. right? Um, and Milton is including them. All right. So let's move to another important point in this book. Milton argues that persuasion is more efficient in right. making people obey than fear. Right. In this sense, is very far from Thomas Hobbes, I believe, not sure. only in this sense, but sure. here is very striking. Could you explain in what way persuasion is so central to Milton's view of politics? Yeah, well, you know, Hobbes is the political philosopher of, of power, and Milton is the poet of liberty. It's really a way to think about them. The question is, what is the role of persuasion? For persuasion. Milton? Why? Why persuasion is so central to because politics? To politics. Because, because persuasion is is the is a means of voluntarism. It's a means of voluntary inclusion. And I mentioned the Areopagus, which plays a role in the trilogy of plays by Aeschylus called the Oresteia, and at the end, it looks like these horrible. Uh, female gods, the Furies, are going to bring down their wrath and fire upon Athens. And Athena comes in, incredible scene in Western literary history, and she comes in and says, I'm going to persuade you. 
mm-hmm. right? At, and at that, in that same trilogy of plays, when they're trying to determine the guilt or innocence of Orestes for killing his father, and they can't come to a decision, Athena says, let's put a court together, mm-hmm. right? So that play or that set of plays is saying democracy and persuasion go together. Because right. and, and, and she says, I'm going to put away for the moment Zeus's thunderbolt. Right. Hobbes takes it out again. Boom. <laughs> right. <laughs> again, it bothers me all the time, the same question. Because yeah. if you say persuasion, yeah. if you are open to persuasion, yeah, but so for if him, you're really open, see, for him, why exclude? Uh, so I'll tell you, for, for him, a Catholic would not be open to persuasion. Mm. Because they're not engaged in this process. For Milton, in Ariopagitic, truth is always imagined in very fluid terms. Truth is a fountain. The Bible is a fountain. Mm. This idea of, it's almost, if you decontextualize it, it's almost, and I always kind of play with my students this way, it's almost like a postmodern conception of the truth. Truth is changing. Mm. Milton is always emphasizing also the importance of the individual. Mm. The individual as an interpreter. So that's... Milton is not a postmodernist, certainly by any measurement, but he does very much embrace the importance of subjective people engaging in thought and discourse, persuasion. Mm -hmm. And really Hobbes is terrified of that because Hobbes sees what happens once things break apart. And for him, the only thing that can control that is power. And he wants all citizens to have the same religion. He wants really people without any agency whatsoever. Mm. Meaning he says in Leviathan that there's only one agent, there's only one free subject, and the free subject is the Leviathan. Mm. Everybody else at a certain, as you know, a certain point, and some hypothetical point in prehistory, decided it was in their interest to give up their free will for safety. Mm. That state of nature all, always already exists for Hobbes. Is this going to be... Uh, 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 a false claim mm. saying that in the end Milton just like Hobbes mm. want a society which has one common religion no, it's not really even fair though, it's, even not though really, it's, not really, it's not really fair because Protestantism is is itself already uh, fragmented it, into different oh not only that denominationally but for Milton Protestantism is a it really licenses every person to I hate to use this metaphor, but to be their own priest because Milton doesn't really believe in the role of the priest. But every individual has to have a relationship to the divine, Mm. independent of churches. While Presbyterians wanted a single church, Milton was an independent. Mm. Um, A contemporary literary critic, Harold Bloom, who some of your listeners may have heard about, called Milton a sect unto himself, a Mm. Protestant church of one. And for Milton, that's the ideal. That kind of ultimate individualism. But then again, as you said, don't go to Catholic Church. Right. right? So if we go just to the last question, which yeah. already has, is related to what we are talking about yeah. now, is that one of Milton's fascinating arguments is, about, is the idea that factions and disagreements within society mm-hmm. are not necessarily a bad thing for exactly. society. Exactly. And, and according to Milton, they are even needed for the uh, search of, for truth. Exactly. And in this respect... I believe, I think Milton seems different from classical political thinkers mm. who wanted to shape a homogeneous society. Mm. Well, until Locke and Mill, et cetera, right? I mean, as you're saying, classical. L- let me sum it up. You just- mentioned also that the, the ideas of pluralism in unity and, and discordia concord. So if you can say a few words so maybe about I'll, it. So maybe I'll try to explain that. So at, towards the end of Ariopagitica, Milton brings an image that stands in for his idea of commonwealth. We were talking before about there not being really any kind of linear argument. Here's one of the images that really just strike out in the text. Okay. So it's Solomon's temple, um, you know, Beit HaMikdash, and Milton says that though there may be many disagreements, sects and schisms, like building blocks, yeah. In the making, that is, the temple has to be built up of different forms of blocks. Nonetheless, despite their difference, they actually form a unity. But he goes back and forth. He says they are, they cannot be continuous in this world. If they're continuous, they're homogeneous. Right. In this world, they're always contiguous. And yet, they create a unity. 
So you it's kind of paradox. Uh, well, that's what poets get to do, right? Um, so he uses this term you mentioned, discordia concours, and he talks about this. Again, goes right back to your question. He talks about brotherly dissimilitudes. So what does that word in, in contain within it? Similitudes, emphasizing similarity. Right. Dissimilitudes, emphasizing difference. difference. Brotherly dissimilitudes, emphasizing similarity. Milton knows that he's writing in paradox, and he's not doing it really to be vague, but I think he's dealing with the same kind of energy that informs your frustration. How do we actually make these distinctions, right? Yeah. What gets included, what doesn't get included? And again, moving on to, into our framework, I, I don't know, Israel is the real test case, because... Israel does define itself as a Jewish democracy. And the question right. is, to right. what extent does the public sphere become Jewish? And to what extent are we willing to allow non-Jewish, are we willing to make non-Jewish citizens feel discomfort with our definition of our state? Right. Come to Bar Ilan when we, when we play <laughs> Hatikva at the end of graduation. And half of our students are Arabs. Right. You know, and I'm not even thinking about whether they're singing or whether they're all very respectful. What I'm thinking about is how does it feel for us to be singing in the presence of citizens, fellow citizens, who are so excluded from that national anthem? Right. I wouldn't be judgmental of Milton. I think you have to see that paradox as Milton struggling with the very mm -hmm. kinds of issues that we're struggling with as, as modern right. citizens of the state of Israel. I think this paradox is also a way of capturing political thought in general. Mm -hmm much beyond Milton before or after, and saying this is the heart of political philosophy, this tension between the part of the similarity and the part of the difference. Right, although it seems like the modern nation-state following the American model is more the Berlin negative liberty version. Doesn't that seem like to you? I mean, I know it's a Christian country, but... In it seems that the most successful or perhaps the only successful models are the liberal public sphere, which really is open mm. and non-restrictive and with minimum definition. Right. As in they're also dangerous yeah. to that because yeah. the state can go in direction that loses the sense of partnership, of the similarity. Right. Sure. Well, that's, that is the, exactly the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, right. Bill. Right. Right. My pleasure. Great.